Welcome to the second Moja community meeting. We have an exciting agenda for today with Benny, Max, and Samay talking about the, there are projects or project proposal. And then uh, Joe of Modula will take questions about standard library. For the future meetings, for the next one, we so far have two people who signed up uh, to talk about their project. If you want to tell us and others about what you're working on, please sign up for the next meeting and or propose the topic for the future meetings. You can just uh, type or make a suggestion in the doc. And uh, with this, I'll hand it off to Benny to talk about Basalt. So Benny, please share your screen. Yep, uh, everyone hear me okay? Let me get my screen sharing going. Um, all right, can everyone here see me, see the screen? We're all good? Yep, all good. Perfect. Um, so just so everyone knows, my name is Benny. I'll get to an introduction really quick. Uh, I'm a student at Cal State Long Beach. Uh, I'm double majoring in computer science and applied math, sophomore standing, or sophomore year, uh, junior standing, so hopefully graduating in two years. Um, I've been coding for about 10 years, machine learning for about three I do mostly Python, Java, and Rust, but mostly recently I've been doing Mojo, of course. Um, I wanna talk about the logo really quick too, and like this presentation in general. Um, it's supposed to kind of look like a box with like graphs on the side. We all know machine learning graphs. Uh, and then the flame at the top is obviously Mojo inspired. Um, I also wanna clarify going into this talk, this is not just gonna be me talking about how amazing Basalt and Mojo is for 15 minutes, um, although both are very cool. I do want to talk about pain points, sharp edges, things that should be worked on both with the project and the language. So with that, some announcements. We have gotten YOLO V8 working and running with a video. So I think this is very cool. Very excited about this. Um, obviously, I want to thank contributors to Stein Wojerbeck would not be possible without him or Andres Novak. Those are the two other main contributors. Not sure if they're on the call today, but would not be possible without them. Um, outside of that, we have a point to release coming soon that was kind of based on the YOLO V8 that took up sampling, uh, just a lot of new operators, resizing, a lot of complicated stuff. I'm not even, Andres would definitely be better to talk about this. Uh, and then some significant speed ups, API improvements. And then we also have now gotten near full Onyx compatibility, meaning we can load and save models with standard weights from Onyx, which also indirectly means we can work with the Max API. Uh, that's not perfect yet, but we're working towards that. So moving on going into goals and philosophy, kind of why we chose Mojo as the language, what we've been building with, why we're doing all this. Parameters is a big thing. So we think that speeds can be above anything that's possible with Python. So things like PyTorch, Keras, TensorFlow, all of those have been heavily optimized, worked on by much more talented programmers than me. I don't think I can code something better than that, but I think with Mojo and the tools that we've been given, we can make something that works a lot faster. So parameters for optimization, a lot of compile time things, uh, you think of a tensor, you know the shape and the size at runtime, you know the type at run or compile time, sorry. Uh, and you can optimize a lot of things away with that, especially for kernels that require square-based sizes. For Matmule is a good example. Um, that's another thing, kernels. And then Mojo in general, all the optimizations it comes with, things like Autotune that have been removed for right now. Um, vectorization is a huge thing, great SIMD support. Parallelization when it is working fully. Things like that are why we feel we can get a lot faster than something like PyTorch and why we think there's a lot of progress to be made here. Um, also extensibility with Max. We know Max doesn't support training officially yet, but it does have a good graph API and it's building out to be something really cool. It works already with PyTorch and Onyx. Right now you can load a model from Basalt indirectly through Onyx into Max and it works correctly. Um, we wanna get this in the future to be directly connected, just interfacing uh, to kind of take out that middleman, take out that middle layer um, and eventually extend some Max utilities. I haven't fully looked into custom operators, but there's probably something to be done there. Uh, and then finally, it's a model project. Obviously, this is a passion project for me. I like working on things. I like building. I'm sure you all understand. Uh, but I want to kind of use this to showcase what Mojo is capable of. I think it fits in really well with the ecosystem. It takes, all, I would say, most of the features from the standard library right now and is using them at least in a way. Um, and it exemplifies kind of key benefits of Mojo. I think this is a good example project for what can be done with the language specifically. It relies a lot on SIMD, a lot on vectorization. And it just is in the niche of Mojo, obviously. Um, with uh, that being said, yeah, question? Sorry, I, I was just going to jump in and say, um, this is not like a max meeting. This is more of a Mojo meeting, but uh, we have a whole bunch of really cool stuff coming. We'd love in a smaller group to put a bunch of stuff in your brain at some point because um, things like training and all this kind of stuff that we don't support, like that's, as you know, is completely solved on the framework side of things. And so like there's, you know, there's lots of cool stuff that you can do there. 
Yeah, awesome. Happy to hear that. Very excited. We can talk about that off call if you want as well. Yeah. Um, first, anyone's bubble, we'll go on to some roadblocks and sharp edges now. Uh, so one of the biggest things optimization is compile time versus runtime. Uh, when I originally made Voodoo, if anyone was familiar with that, everything was done at runtime and it was fairly quick, uh, but not the best solution. With Basalt, we've moved away from that, and all of the graph computation is at least ideally going to be done at compile time. So you're generating the graph, you're optimizing the graph when we add that in, getting all the layers, getting all the tensors at compile time, and then just running the code through for optimizing or for running kernels and doing backpropagation at runtime. Um, with that, though, we've experienced a lot of issues, error handling. Um, I know the team has spoken about not wanting to make a distinct separation between compile time and runtime, and I, I see the point in that. Um, constrained has been very useful for this, but there are still some things where errors can be caught and handled differently at compile time than runtime, and we need functions to be able to work for both. Uh, so there's a little bit of complication there, but definitely something to be flushed out as errors progress in the language. Um, optimizations in general, there seem to be some weird issues with parallelization, vectorization, things like that. And also where to optimize. If it's at compile time, do we need to optimize things? Does it get generated through Emler LLVM, do we need to even put in vectorization if it's just being turned into code? There's a little bit of ambiguity there. Um, and then finally, Emler and LLVM, like I mentioned, there's some issues with unrolling. I think there's some open issues on GitHub with math functions specifically. I know square root can't be done at compile time. Uh, I think that's being addressed, but that's one of the bigger things that's come up. Another thing is decorators. Uh, one in particular. Yeah, you, please. You're charging forward. I know you have a ton of stuff to get through, but um, uh, are you getting good traction and reaction from the little friction points you're getting, like square root not being comp time and stuff like that? Uh, sorry, can you repeat the question one more time? Are, 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 when you're reporting things, are we getting good fixes in? Like, are you getting... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I will... I'll circle around to that, but all of these issues are either have an open issue or have been partially fixed or at least in the pipeline for being fixed. Awesome. So. Yeah. I should mention that at the beginning, but yeah, great job with that. Um, moving on, decorators. One in particular has been very problematic, very, uh, I'm forgetting the word, but you know, we all know what I'm talking about. Register passability. What even is it? How does it work? Does it change speeds? I've noticed on my machine, sometimes I get faster speeds, sometimes faster compilation times. Um, there, The way it's described in the docs is kind of ambiguous. We're not really sure how to use it. And there's been talks about removing it from the language entirely, which obviously I'm okay with. Uh, just a little bit of ambiguity there. And then also decorators in general, not being able to create custom decorators stops us from doing things like no grad and PyTorch, um, not being able to pass context variables like graph. If you look at the API right now, every time you add an operation, you have to do g.op and then the operation. With decorators, we think we would be able to move the g out and just have operator and then put in the operator. But right now that's not really possible without global variables, which we want to kind of not use. Uh, and then finally, one of the bigger things, this is kind of the reason I have talked about before not using Mojo for professional development. Um, unstable ground's a big thing. And I know this is obviously, it comes with a new language. This is something you have to deal with for a while. Um, but Mojo popularity isn't really stable right now. We don't know where this language is going. There's not full documentation. And then there's obviously some features that are still going in and out of the pipeline. Autotune's a great example. This has been going through some iterations. I think it was, we talked about last meeting, it might come back soon, excited for that. Parallelization, I don't know how many issues I've seen about this, but it not really, it doesn't really work fully right now. It doesn't use all my cores at least. Uh, I know a lot of community members just talked about it being kind of weird to work with. Uh, and then also the graph API, like you said, obviously a lot to be done there, a lot coming in the pipeline, very excited to hear all that. Uh, but yeah, just in general, the main issues with Mojo as a language stem from it being newer. I don't think there's anything really at its core that's problematic for this kind of a project or anything in general. All of these are smaller things. So I'm excited to see where the language will go. I think there's a lot of development and progress we made. I don't really see anything directly stopping progress right now. It's all just a matter of pushing out more code, making more progress and figuring out those complicated issues. And I appreciate taking time to look through those issues and figure out the best way to do it instead of just throwing some things out there and seeing if they work. Uh, so with that, thank you of course for having me. It's amazing to have this kind of a talk give this kind of thing. And I want to give some time for Q&A at the end for any questions about Basalt, the language, my experience, anything anyone would like, just turn on your mic, raise your hand or talk. You're welcome to. Okay. Any questions to Benny? It's okay if there are no questions too. I could start. Um... Uh, this looks really cool and really impressive. Um, how long do you think, or how much time do you think you've spent in in putting this together? That's a great question. Um, I originally started with Voodoo, which was a similar project, and I spent about 
two or three months on that by myself, uh, working with a few other people. Uh, after that, joining Stein and Andres, it's been about two months since we started working together on that. I don't know if we've all dedicated like 40 hour work weeks to it, but definitely as a side project, we've worked on it for about three months. Okay. Uh, I think we have some hands raised. Jeff, if you want to go. Okay. Yeah. Um, do you have issues filed for those lists of things you mentioned, like unrolling and um, unrolling? There's, I assume you mean calling raising functions at compile time is the yep. other one. Yeah, a lot of people have brought that one up. We should do that. <laughs> it's yeah, it's um, somewhere on the it's somewhere on the pipeline, but we should probably get that one done. Um, and then you know, basically for each of those mentions, are those issues for those? I'm, I'm particularly interested in the unrolling one. Um, yes, anything uh, to do with is... like the compiler not doing what you think it should be doing in terms of performance, I'm I'm interested in because those are like a little bit more nebulous to track. Um, and so the, so if you have issues for these, like please shoot them in the chat or like send them somewhere. I don't know. Um, yeah, once we're done with questions, I'll send the issues in the chat or I can DM you. But there is, especially the unrolling one, I can find the issue. I think I've talked to, I think Sora might be the original poster on that one. Nice. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Rob, did you have a question? Yeah, sure. No, thanks. This was great feedback. Um, you mentioned concurrency issues and you mentioned something. Uh, it was a whirlwind kind of uh, talk, so I, I probably have to replay the, the video to, to get them all. But uh, you mentioned just kind of like concurrency issues and not being able to use all your course. Could you unpack that a little bit more about what? Yeah, so see? yeah, um, absolutely. In, in my experience with parallelization, as well as the people I work with, uh, we've had a lot of issues getting it to run at full speed, using all cores on the CPU, even if you specify how many cores it should be using. Uh, and also a lot of overhead getting started past what we feel is reasonable for that kind of a feature. To the extent where we, we're not really using it in Basalt right now, there's a couple kernels that use parallelization, but for the most part, we've shied away from it. Um, we want to allow it in the future and have it, we've, obviously, that's something that's important to machine learning, uh, but we've had a lot of issues getting it to work fully, getting a function to run on all cores at the same time and ending. So I'm not sure if there's a specific issue open for that, but I can link a couple related issues after we're done with this. Awesome. Thanks so much. Yep. Okay. Anyone else? Okay, thank you, Benny. Uh, thank you. Appreciate your presentation. So next we'll hear from Max. Hello. Oh, Rob, do you still have a hand or you just forgot to down it? Oh, no, sorry about that. Okay, so then let's move to Max. Yes, hello everyone. I'm looking for my slides where I can find it, like in Zoom. <laughs> Takes me a few seconds, just a minute. Mm -hmm. I see someone, but I don't see. Ah, here we go. At the bottom of the screen, you should see share a screen. I'll see. Yeah, now you should be able to. Sorry for that. You should be able to see my slides, right? Yes. As far as I understand. Uh, perfect. All right. So, uh, welcome everyone. My name is Maxim, uh, and I would like to talk about a library I wrote, which is called uh, Compact Dict. Um, in um, hindsight, uh, uh, I think I should call it uh, um, Scrooge McDict because, like, genuinely, the main idea behind the library is. To have a dictionary which has like the most uh, efficient um, data you um, memory usage. So uh, it turned out to be quite fast, but like the main goal was actually to make uh, the most memory uh, um, space efficient um, dict, which is also quite um, simple in itself. All right. So if you uh, we look at the some kind of uh, that was um, struct itself. You can see here that it's just basically we have some parameterizations and compile some parameter, uh, parameterization and some values. And uh, um, generally, uh, the main idea behind this um, data structure is that it's actually a struct of arrays, meaning that uh, what I'm doing is basically I have like fields and I'm um, storing uh, keys, values, and um, some flags in a list versus um, how, for example, Python normally does it. They have like key value pairs. The problem is mainly because if you store things as a list, it, it can be much more space efficient. 
And also in case of dictionaries uh, as well, uh, we need to find a key and we just basically need to um, sometimes iterate through keys or jump around a little bit in, in this list. And it's uh, unnecessary to jump over keys and values because they um, take up much more space. And if you want to uh, be kind of like cache efficient, uh, uh, this is actually like um, CPU cache uh, efficient. This is actually not as efficient as uh, if you have a um, struct of arrays. So uh, the dict that you see here is actually a string dict. So in my library, I have actually two modules. I have a string dict and I have a generic dict. Uh, I wouldn't have time to talk about generic dict. Um, um, so uh, here I'm just concentrating on the string dict and I'm trying to just explain how it works. Um, and uh, yeah. So um, we can also see that it is a, a string dict because like we see that the values are stored as a list of these, so um, collection elements, but the keys are stored as key container, um, parameterized over a uh, um, key offset type. So what is the keys container? It's basically a, a special data structure, which I uh, wrote, which again follows the struct of array, uh, um, struct of arrays uh, principle. And here, what I do is basically I say like, okay, when I'm uh, adding keys um, to a dictionary, they will be stored just in line back to back so that you have just one, um, basically just one region um, uh, where you store, um, store stuff. And then we also have a list of key ends where we say like, uh, for example, here we have full bar buzz. And I store that the first one ends at index three, the second one and, uh, at index six, and the third one at index nine. So basically then uh, if we subtract here, we know the size and where we st where it starts and where, uh, where it uh, ends, right? Uh, 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 yes. I, Max, I, I've seen many hash tables and mm. one in many of them, I've never seen anything like this. Is I mean that in a good way, by the way. But um, uh, is this is this like a precedent way to do string string maps that you're attempting here? This one actually, I came up uh, uh, with myself. So normally, you would just say like uh, uh, the keys are what you can see here, right? So yeah. you say key is actually a list of strings. Problem is that uh, each string has a size, a capacity, and a pointer. To, right. to the data, right? So you have always like 24 bytes of overhead. And as I said, like what I tried to concentrate on uh, in the first place was the stinginess to be like as memory efficient as possible. Yeah, well, I, I, I mean, I, I I love it. I, I haven't seen this trade-off in hash tables before. Like, mm -hmm. So if you look at the LVM um, string map thing, for example, it, it takes advantage of the fact that given that strings are variable length, mm -hmm. You therefore have to do a malloc, or quotes have to. You're showing not, but mm -hmm. and therefore putting the the value into that node and then making a nice quadratically probed, fairly standard hash table, uh, all works out because you're specializing the fact that strings are variable length. But here you're saying, no, 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 you don't have to do a malloc, which I think is super interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so like uh, for me, I uh, have lots of experience in um, data serialization formats, binary data serialization formats. It's actually kind of like comes more from this um, uh -huh. yeah. angle. <laughs> so there, it's more frequent. Like I think uh, basically the um, arrow strings look similar. So arrow is a um, data serialization format, uh, which is widely used Apache arrow and they do similar thing as far as I know. That's super interesting. This one is kind of like my invention, but generally I, uh, it also like based on, uh, because I, I'm not sure if they storing keys, uh, keys ends or something else. Mm -hmm. I'm not hundred percent sure about this, but yeah. This is yeah, what... I mean, the, the disadvantage is that when you remove keys from the map, you now get fragmentation in the space and stuff like this, yes, and, yes, or yes. you have to decide if you don't care or things like this, but anyways, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry so, to yeah. interrupt you, but uh, super no problem. interesting. I haven't seen some no problem. Like, uh, we will, uh, actually, I can briefly also, like, uh, uh, point to deletion. Right, so 
we are uh, here we also can be stingy about the size of the key ends because like basically the key end this is where this key end uh, d type um, comes from where we can say like okay if i know that my uh, i have actually quite small dictionaries and they won't have like the total bytes of keys won't be more than 256 uh, bytes for example then i can just you uh, use you int for the keys end and i don't have to um, have an end for example here as, as an example right if i would have an end i would have actually seven bytes of zeros everywhere but with uh, mojo i can parameterize it uh, if i know it's small i can just say like okay actually i would like to store just one byte per a keys end or two bytes per keys, uh, a keys end if I know that it won't exceed um, 64K and so on and so forth. By default, it's um, 32. So like four gigabytes should be enough, I guess. But you could also just say like, okay, I have like really huge and I go within eight bytes um, domain. Right, uh, same goes for the key hashes and slot indexes. So like what we have here, basically in the dictionary, we have the keys, we have, uh, we have the key hashes. Key hashes is just when you have a key, which is a string, then you uh, run it through a hash function and then you get like the value and this one we can uh, cache. Then we have the values and we, uh, we have a uh, slot to index. Like the interesting part is the slot to index is actually where uh, we have more, uh, of them uh, than we need. Normally, uh, resizing in the contact dict um, goes by, I think, 85%. Um, so basically, it. Uh, um, uh, so you will have lots of like empty spaces, and hence it's good if you can say like, okay, I know I will have a dictionary which will be, uh, which will have less than 256 keys. I don't need to represent it with, uh, with an eight byte int, I can represent it with one byte, right? So uh, again, all about like being stingy with memory. And this actually also gives you much better cache locality and, yeah, and uh, could reflect in uh, performance, uh, better performance, right? Uh, we don't want to pay for things that we don't need. This is why we have these uh, flags over here. So basically with dictionaries, in lots of use cases, we actually normally don't delete. We just want to build up a lookup, right? In cases where we don't uh, need to delete, we also don't have to populate the uh, um, um, deleted mask. So I have a deleted mask here. It's uh, actually a bit mask internally. I uh, didn't uh, create a... Um, special data structure for this because like the counting um, capacity you already have. So I don't just wanted to um, duplicate it. So hence I just have like a uh, few methods where I do the typical uh, uh, bit set operations to check if um, something is deleted or not. But generally if a user says like, I uh, would like to have non-destructive dict, I will not remove anything from the dict anyways then this um, deleted mask is not populated. And if a user uh, still calls delete on uh, uh, the dictionary, then it will raise an exception. What would be nice from the language to, um, to actually to be uh, able to kind of decorate to say like, I, wouldn't, uh, I would like to not have this field at all <laughs> at compile time, but yeah, maybe something for a future as a uh, future request. Right. Um, same goes with the cached uh, um, hash values, um, mainly because like um, they are useful when you know that you'll do rehashing. They are very useful for um, a problem. It is nice to have, but it's uh, it's a little bit faster to um, compare to. Uh, integers when compared to strings. So it's a little bit faster, but generally if you say like, okay, I would like to uh, reduce the memory footprint, then you can also set a, a, a parameter saying like, okay, I don't care about um, caching hashes. Uh, we'll compute them on demand uh, again, which makes stuff a little bit slower, but uh, consumes less memory. Yeah, another advantage of caching hashes is that you don't have to actually chase the pointer to do the stir comp. 
Mm-hmm. So it's it's not even yeah. The, yeah, yeah. The so off. this is basically equality, like the, right? The cash, so like, the cash miss that you take. So, but you will do the uh, cash comparison at some point, uh, uh, anyways, you, because like basically, you, yeah. When, 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 end, you get right? to the, when you get to the actual hit, you need to just yes, 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 yes. This is basically what I meant with linear probing. So uh, with linear probing, I will if I just compare ints, it's it's fast. If I need to kind of each time compare strings. Uh, this is slower, yeah, but yeah. All right, then this is it, as I have only 10 minutes, so I try to rush through it. There is lots of more to um, talk about, like you can find the, uh, the library itself here. There is also a, a library uh, of mine where I compare them uh, of a, different hash functions. And if you are genuinely interested in how uh, dict dictionaries are, working specifically in Python, this blog post is great. So it goes in much more detail. Uh, as I said, like um, compact dict is slightly different, but in general, uh, most of the things still apply. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. I can take questions. Any questions to Maxim? Do you benchmark this against other implementations? Yes, yes, yes. yes. So uh, I didn't put a benchmark uh, today in here because like, again, it will take time and uh, it's a little bit like benchmarking. It's a little bit like uh, it's on my machine. I, I actually benchmarked it on uh, M1 machine and on Intel machines. So currently um, like, uh, Couple of weeks ago, it was much faster than the standard li uh, um, standard library dict. Uh, the hash function was uh, um, dramatically improved in standard library, which um, um, you can see. So currently, I see uh, I um, have multiple use cases where I have like different lang um, text in different languages, which I break down into words and then uh, uh, create a lookup. So there I see that uh, compact dict is up to three times faster from like two to three times faster still. But then again, like uh, the hash function is still, uh, which I use is uh, a little bit faster than what we have as, uh, currently in standard library. And, and uh, then I would say when uh, I created a proposal where uh, we can replace um, hash functions, uh, easily as users, basically, then we could, it would be an apple to apple comparison um, to say like, okay, we have the same um, hash functions and now we can just check the implementation of, uh, of a uh, uh, dictionary as is. Other questions? Okay. This is very cool. You taught me something about hash tables, so that's <laughs> unusual. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, let's move on. Uh, Same. Let's talk about Ooh, yes. Lambdas. Um, yeah. Uh, first of all, thanks for having me. Uh, I'm a little bit nervous, or or maybe excited, maybe a bit of bit of uh, both those together. Uh, but let's get into it. Yeah, wishful thinking, data frames and Mojo, how to build something like Spark, Pandas, or NVIDIA Rapids, or something like that. Um, first, I want to start by talking about the state of data frames in the world. Um, here are some popular libraries. Maybe your favorite library is not on here. Um, please don't hate me for that. Um, you have Pandas, which is like everyone knows about it. It's like the default choice for working with uh, data tabular data. Um, it's, not the, it's not the best API because it was made a long time. Um, it doesn't have a distributed way to do things. I mean, there are things you can do on top of it, but not Pandas itself. Um, Polars, um, which is really cool, written in Rust. Um, the community loves it. Um, it's not as widely adopted yet in like big companies, but um, people active in the data frame circles um, really like it. Um, UDFs, UDFs are user-defined functions. Um, so, you know, when you have tabular data and you want to write a custom function for something that happens to each row or each column, they're called UDFs. 
If you write them in Python, they're slow. Surprise, surprise. Um, and if you write them in Rust, they're inconvenient um, for researchers and data science -y folks. Um, it's one of the fastest. I've written fastest here, but it's among the fastest. Um, but there's no support for distributed yet. Another one is Spark, um, also widely adopted. Going to edit my presentation on the fly. Um, same story with UDFs. If you do it in Python, it's slow. But if you want it to be fast, you have to write it in Scala or Java or something like that. And they have this really funny like pay for performance um, business model where if you're on Databricks, you can use the Photon engine, which some people are not the biggest fans of. Um, honorable mentioned Data Fusion. Um, it's a distributed query engine written in Rust, not quite as popular as the other three. Um, anyway, I talk about all of this because there's there's huge potential for Mojo, um, similar to how um, you know in the uh, when we when we talk about Mojo, it's supposed to solve fragmentation across languages. You know, there's potential for that over here as well, uh, because people are writing UDFs in um, uh, you know other languages if they want it to run fast, or it runs slow if you write it in Python. Um, it should be friendly to non-programmers, so academics or researchers or other data science -y folks um, that may not share our enthusiasm for programming over here. Um, and yeah, something that works on CPU or GPU, if, whether something works on a single machine or petabyte scale clusters, there, there is potential here. Um, and I think that's why people are so excited about Polars because it addresses some of these needs. Um, and lastly, uh, most like real life data science work. Um, so I come from an ML engineering background and for a couple of years I've been a manager for um, applied science and engineering teams. Um, most data science work is actually data processing, like working in your data frame library and then doing feature engineering. Uh, feature engineering means like putting data differently into the machine learning model. People aren't implementing machine learning models all the time. They're basically putting it into XGBoost. That's like most ROI positive machine learning these days. Um, so that being said, what do we need to do? We could build a data frame lib but we should really build the right data frame library. Um, and I there's there's two um, fundamental blocks we need to build before we actually go ahead and build one. Um, one is a cloud file system abstraction, and the second is Apache Arrow. Apache Arrow is huge, um, is, is super important. And then when we have both of these things built, we can build a new data frame library, or we can build Mojo wrappers for existing popular data frame libraries. Um, so what does that mean uh, about cloud file system abstractions? Uh, the why is uh, it's it's good to have um, IO and cloud auth solved. No one wants to like be there sitting on their computer figuring out why they can't download their files from S3. Um, I've done that for hours and it is not my idea of a fun time. <laughs> um, and in a, yeah, so if you don't, have uh, even if you have the best library, if you can't get your data, no one will use it. Um, and this is one of the cheekier things I like to say, you need data to do science. Um, so yeah, make the data available. Um, how um, FS spec is a really nice package from Python that takes care of this. Um, and it's supported by a bunch of different um, data frame libraries. Um, just implementing all of the methods uh, in the abstract file system class, um, but maybe name them better. Um, if they're in, if the um, if the trait for a file system is in the standard lib, then there can be like one trait that everyone can gather around. Um, it should be like pretty. It shouldn't be controversial. So it's stuff like move, copy, put, get, whatever. Uh, and then some motivating examples for this. Um, yeah, I mentioned FS FS spec does this well. Uh, Spark has its own implementation uh, based on top of Hadoop file systems, but they do it brilliantly. Uh, you have the protocol, like what, what cloud you want to connect to, and then a path, and they have glob support and whatnot, and you can read Parquet files and JSON files and whatnot. Um, so that's really cool. This is so, really timely because I believe the standard library folks are looking at uh, async IO right now Yeah, and building out our um, asynchronous well, I, uh, <laughs> they built <laughs> asynchronous IOS uh, components out. So this is actually really timely that you mentioned something like this. And I can see how we can scale this out to like not just the local file system um, and to cloud file systems as well or distributed file systems. So it's really cool. Thanks for mentioning this.
That's awesome. That's really cool. And and plus uh, one for your your general point of like make the back end pluggable and orthogonal from all the clients. Like I think that's 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 very important. And a great time to do that, as Jeff says. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Um moving on from uh cloud file systems, what exactly is Apache Arrow or slash an abridged history of data frames? In the 70s, you had relational databases introducing like the tabular way of working with data. Uh, in the 80s, you have SAS and SPSS using tabular data. In the 90s, this is where the data frame is actually introduced. Um, and then in 2008, um, Pandas is created by Wes McKinney um, to have this data frame um, functionality. And then a bunch of stuff happens in the world that I haven't mentioned. 2016, Apache Arrow was announced. And in 2024 today, Apache Arrow has a massive ecosystem across uh, languages and frameworks, and you can do zero copy interop between langs. Um, it's amazing. Uh, Apache Arrow, I realized I didn't mention, it's an in-memory format of what tabular data should look like. Um, and I have a bunch of other things that I've written here, but I'm not going to speak in the interest in the interest of time. Um, but the the presentation link is in the the community doc. Um, so feel free to look at it there. Um, so, so why Apache Arrow and, and not something else? Um, so yeah, it's an in-memory data format for tabular data across language. Um, it has a massive ecosystem, like anything you can think of in the data world supports it. Um, and it's really important to be able to like plug into and out of um, like any component. So let's say you have a really good Parquet reader in C++. Um, it reads Parquet to Arrow. Um, then suddenly a Mojo data frame library doesn't need to rewrite um, the Parquet uh, implementation or, or the reader implementation. We can just use the fastest one that's available, um, call it, and then suddenly you have a data frame in Mojo. And similar for similarly for writing it too, right? I always taken care of. So file formats, JSON, Parquet taken care of. You can do interop with other data frame libraries. Um, uh, all the popular machine learning frameworks, uh, they support pandas, so they support Arrow, uh, and you can, you've can instantly unlocked like all the machine learning libraries that already exist that you can just use. Um, also visualization and whatnot. Um, and yeah, uh, I mentioned this already. Yeah, fun fact, my first attempt at Apache Arrow and Mojo was in May of 2023, uh, which was like right here. It's super early mojo. And then I took a massive break and now I'm back. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, what would we have to do? Um, I'm just gonna rush through the next slides because we don't have so much time. Um, some milestones would be implementing the spec, uh, getting zero copy interop with C, Rust, and PyArrow. Um, a, a really achievable dream is to have UDFs for pandas and polars. Uh, if we can write mojo UDFs for these libraries, um, like that's a really uh, easy way to like make a splash on the internet. People will be super excited. Um, and then like a pipe dream really far out is to have this like uh, silicon agnostic uh, single laptop or petabyte scale cluster distributed query engine with a data frame library. Someone like could start a company that does only this. Um, and yeah, solving the UDF problem. I mentioned that, I'm not gonna talk about it again. Tooling that might help from the modular side um, I created a uh, an issue for um, a memory allocation watcher when I worked um, with uh, Apache Arrow interop between um, Julia and Python. It was really helpful to see how many allocations were being made. So the idea here is like you have a width block uh, with an allocation, um, and then you have some some things that happen inside that width block, and then you can say okay within this width block there were like uh, 20 allocations that were made that made 64 bytes of allocations. If you can put like how many in a language that sometimes does copies for you, if you could have unit tests that say, you know, this code shouldn't do more than this much allocation, that would be super like helpful in, in iterating fast over performant code. Uh, so yeah, let's go. Um, this is a pretty massive undertaking. Um, uh, maybe actually, actually, before go, if just going back to the whole malloc tracking, I think that's super interesting. Right. Um, we we do have control over what allocation. I mean, not control, but we have 
a lot of influence over what the default allocator is and things like this and the interface for that. And so we could look into building uh, I don't know, instrumentation points and things like that to be able to get this kind of metadata back. I think the only concern is how do we make it so it's zero cost when you're not using it or at least low enough cost that it's that's uh, appealing. But that that is that is super interesting. Having just even an allocation count would be, uh, you know, one atomic increment <laughs> could be, could maybe is enough. I don't know. Yeah, this is actually super awesome feedback because um, in my past life, this is this is like tooling that I'm fairly used to having available and was kind of curious if this was something the community would want. So this is this is really great feedback to hear that this is this is something that would be useful. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Um, yeah, I realized I've I've been talking at like a hundred miles an hour, but um, basically, if you're interested in in collaborating on Arrow, let me know. Um, uh, yeah, and um, maybe I'll open it for questions now. And I think this is super cool. I mean, just some feedback, I don't know if it's a question, but um, the, the file system abstraction thing is, as Jeff and others were saying, it's really timely. I think we should totally figure that out and figure out a way to make it nicely extensible so that you can, you, you can like bring your own backend for file system. Um, the uh, arrow and data frame stuff, I think it's gonna be really cool. Um, I think the question there, and I, I love how you're approaching it is like, here's a, a maximal leverage way to work with the ecosystem. I think that's really cool. But I think the, the question becomes a big API design question and you know, kind of has Mojo grown up enough to make it really ergonomic and, and beautiful and easy to use? Um, you know, Can you make it static enough that you can get high performance, but dynamic enough that it's actually possible to use it without <laughs> annoying everybody who wants to try to do something. But that's I'd love true. To yeah, that's a that's a really good question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what would be nice is if it's like friendly and ergonomic enough for folks that are like not programmers by profession to yeah. use. Um, and it's easy enough for them. But for those of us that are like hardcore programmers, yeah. um, we and we like to, you know, fiddle with everything, we can yeah. do that too. I'd love to see, I mean, as you continue to explore this, what, what you come up with. It's really cool. Cool. Thank you very much. Yeah. This is very interesting. Let us know if you, how other people can help you with this. Okay. We have uh, 15 minutes left for Q&A about Moja standard library. Joe. Okay. Yeah, for, yeah. thank you. First of all, I just want to say thank you to everyone that presented today and gave all of the feedback, both on the language and library side and helping making ecosystem better for everyone. Like we really appreciate all of your feedback. It's, it's great. Um, can't promise we'll be able to do it all instantly, uh, you know, as much as everyone would like to, but we will get there over time. And so we're happy to keep building this thing with you guys. Um, and so to build on that, like I just wanted to share some numbers real quick. Like since we opened source two months ago, you guys have already introduced 361 PRs that have been merged, which is insane. You guys are way exceeding our expectations and we're struggling to keep up, but it's super great. And we're really happy. Um, so even though you may see us struggling a little bit, like we're doing our best to keep up. So bear with us uh, as we're building up the team and being able to keep up with you guys. And so I just wanted to open the floor here just for general Q&A. Um, if anyone has any questions about library, roadmap, that sort of thing. Hey, hey Joe, can you also, uh, just a thing that might be interesting to people, um, can you talk about conditional conformances? Because my head just about exploded yesterday. <laughs> yeah, so uh, some people that have been contributing to the standard library um, may have seen that the community stumbled across the fact that we have conditional conformances, which surprised Chris last night. Um, and that we're already using this in list and dictionary in the standard library. Because when traits, when traits came out at the end of last year, this was actually one of the first things I asked for was conditional conformances. And Chris told me, go away for a couple of months, like go, go play with the traits that you have. Um, and so we played with the traits that we had and then standard library contributors came and stumbled across the feature that I asked for. And so it's a, it's a delightful surprise. So for those that aren't familiar with what we mean by conditional conformances, um, it's the idea that you can have like a refinement on a method that even though it's more specific uh, from the consumer side than what the original class type says that it conforms to. And so imagine you have like a list over some generic T 
um, but you want to have like a string function, an str member function. Um, but internally that may have other requirements like all of the members are stringable and that sort of thing. Um, and so that would be one example where you have a refinement. And there's some additional syntax that would be nice from the language perspective to have these like anonymous trait compositions. But for now being able to define a sort of one-off trait in order to do that conditional conformance, it's certainly a, a well-received workaround <laughs> in the meantime. And it is the Chris, blessed believe, path right now. <laughs> Chris, I believe you actually added the support when you spiffed up parameter inference to deal with conversions to support reference self. Yep. So thank you, Chris, for adding conditional conformance and then discovering it. <laughs> oh, so, so, so if I if I share my own little path of plight, right? So I did all this work to make it so you can make self be of type reference, which then forced all this massive generalization of name lookup and all this kind of stuff. And then uh, Nick convinced me we should rip all that stuff out. And so I ripped out all that stuff just a couple days ago. And we have a much simpler, much more beautiful thing. Check it out in the release notes uh, for the nightly that's coming out. Um, and so I was all depressed because I did all this work for no good reason. It was all, you know, just wasted rabbit hole that I fall into. And then turns out it's useful. So this is cool. So I'm very excited about that. Notably, it unlocks a lot of library work that we've been sitting on. And so you may see some warts, like the fact that we have several different pointer types, which is confusing to new users of the language, with like dtype pointer, unsafe pointer. This gives us a nice mechanism to unify them all. And so specifically, we're going to be start pushing for, uh, even in the last couple of days, we've been removing some methods off of dtype pointer, and we're going to be converging on a single pointer type where those additional methods are are defined in terms of these conditional conformances. And so overall, the library will be a lot simpler for everyone. Yeah, I mean, I mean just, um, uh, just to test it out, I moved a bunch of global functions that work with pointers. So the like initialize and destroy the operator new and delete kind of equivalent stuff can now be members on pointers or unsafe pointer instead of being global functions. Because you can now say unsafe pointer works with any type, but um, transfer from or whatever it's called requires movability and so you can say hey this method only exists if the element type is movable even though um, unsafe pointer works with anything exactly so. yeah and that landed in today's nightly release and someone called it out on discord as like this is a good example of conditional conformance so cool. anyways uh that's just me being excited do people have other questions um, i don't see any I, uh, I I have maybe a question. Um, I'm Stan. I'm also one of the guys working on Bessel together with Benny. Um, and so, as Benny explained, we we are heavily relying on uh, compile time features. Um, and now that we are like going to larger and lo larger models, comp compile time is like increasing uh, quite a lot. Like it for me, it takes about one minute. I know for Andre, it takes like two minutes to. To, to compile and work on and developing the architecture of the model. Um, and I was wondering if, if there are like things you can do to, can, to decrease it or if there are things being done or on the roadmap to like, decrease compile time a little. So if you're getting compile time issues from doing too much stuff at compile time, like, a, like compile time interpretation, there was some big improvements that landed last week or the week before, I don't remember. Um, in terms of like general problems around compile time and code instantiation, it's kind of a um, it's a long-standing effort to kind of fight this dragon because of course the moment you make compile time better, people go write more code and then you're back where you started, right? Um, so I probably would need a more like interesting breakdown of the problems you're facing. Uh, it it's a mix of maybe there's like a bug or maybe like. There's some strategies on the on the programmer side of like not instantiating too much code kind of problem because if you instant if you're if you're using highly parametric code and instantiating just a ton of functions there's really like not much to do at that point um so it, it it's it's it has to be a bit more tactical in that sense um basically what I'm saying is I'd love to understand the problems you're facing more and then we can kind of dig into it mm, yeah it's it's probably too long to to explain in detail, but um, the the main thing is uh, compiling all the shapes of of of, of all the ops uh, of uh, the graph. Have you tried in the last couple of days, or are you on the last month's build? 
Yeah, I'm still on the last last month's build, so maybe I'll see it coming and I'll, and I'll try out the nightly one. Yeah, so the stuff that Jeff is mentioning was like 10 or 100x improvement on some internal stuff. So, oh, okay. So, okay, I, I definitely might, need to might, it. It might make your life good enough that trying out the nightly is worth it, Brie. <laughs> yeah, indeed. I will. Thanks. No guarantees, right? It completely depends. And, and, to some to a certain extent like if you're writing uh mantle broad at compile time or something it's gonna it's, compile time is gonna take time proportional to the amount of work but but i think jeff fixed some massive issues which is great any other questions comments thoughts uh do we want to talk about uh format of the meeting and continuing to learn and iterate do people have suggestions on um what we could do better or maybe topics for next week or next two weeks. Everybody's shy. Yeah. So if anybody wants to tell about what they are working on, as you can see, this is non scary and it's a great way to let community know what you're doing and get feedback. Or tell us what else you would like to see at these meetings. We can also I'm also happy to trim the potential future topics list by answering two of the questions at the bottom, if that makes life easier for anyone, since we have a few minutes. Of uh, So let's see. So we'll go with the testing framework and Mojo test there, since that's towards the bottom. Uh, this is something that the standard library is actively exploring as we're starting to push a little bit more on Mojo tests as a public feature coming out in this, this release. Uh, so I'd, I'd recommend you stay tuned in the coming weeks. We're actively um, working on some feature requests for Mojo tests in order to make it a pleasant experience for everyone going forward. Because um, we'd love to get off of Lit as well. We've been actively pushing on that the last couple of months, and we're almost there. Um, the second question was around from Maxim regarding benchmarks for the standard library. Uh, that is also something we are actively working on, Maxim. Uh, that may even be something that it may land in a minimal form probably this week. We have some public micro benchmarks for the standard library. Uh, right now, we're just gonna, I just need to write some scripts on so how people can run them locally uh, using the closed source packages like the benchmark packages and stuff like that. Um, right now in the immediate short term, we're not committing to public CI for these benchmarks. It's purely just to unblock uh, external contributor work so people can do A-B testing on their local machine and get some ideas of how we're writing micro benchmarks for the standard library. And then we'll keep drawing from there. But I just want to unlock people first. So stay tuned for the next couple of days. Yeah. Just uh, from my side, I think it's um, super important because like lots of things uh, where maybe we could uh, improve the standard library a little bit uh, without the benchmarks. It's great that uh, it's um, coming. So like lots of great things. Can... Yeah, exactly. I'd love to enable your work with sorting, hashing, and then Gabriel's work with SSO. It's definitely the immediate play there. Thank you. Thank you for nudging me to prioritize this. <laughs> okay. So we have five minutes left. If people just want to talk about what they would like to see at these meetings. Maybe at some point we should have some talks from modular folks and not just external folks. Yeah. Um, anything you guys would like to hear from us? Um, I know that we have an agenda item up here about long-term goals. That's a little ambitious of a talk topic for let's say next week. But uh, besides that, is there um, like any other things you want to talk about? Like let's say I think generics would be cool. Maybe we can talk about what the what the what the medium term like couple months ahead roadmap might look like for generics given that we are accidentally discovered that we have conditional conformances <laughs> uh, and stuff like that. I mean, the, an, an, another thing could be a deep dive on async. That's another thing. Yes. Yeah, that was going to be, that was something I was going to stick up my hand. So we were going to be doing fairly soon. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, we'll, we, once we get the plan in place for async await, we, we'll, we'll definitely present it here and get community feedback. As of the nightly tonight, you should finally be able to write async functions that can raise again. 
uh, after they got removed like a couple months ago, I think. So they're, they're back at it again. You can like have an async function that returns a string now as well. Uh, and hopefully there'll be fewer memory leaks, but we're, we're constantly improving on this front. Okay, well, I thank you everybody for, for presenting and sharing your thoughts. This was awesome. I think we are done for today. I'll see everybody in two weeks. Fantastic. Thank you, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.